The Lost World. So after the opening titles, there's an appearance by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, originator of the saying, Once you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And also, I believe dinosaurs are living in Brazil. After a little poem that essentially says that this work is for those who are half an adult, half a kid, you know, meaning it's for the kid and all of us in a way, but there's some maturity involved, you get the point. We get on with a meeting with Ed, who is going to propose to his girlfriend Gladys, but she tells him not to, and then starts playing with the cat. When pressed, she says she doesn't just want some guy, she wants a real man. Someone who has stared down death and done great things. You know, all that crap. All he's looking for is a nice ass. So as he heads off to find such an opportunity to prove himself, we cut to his newspaper, where the editor is concerned about a lawsuit from Professor Challenger. He's assured that you can't really be sued for not believing a man who claims he saw dinosaurs, as set by the precedent People v. Flintstone. Challenger's a bit unhinged because he had taken all these photos only to have the film so badly damaged when his canoe overturned that it doesn't really qualify as evidence. But the professor is not taking this news well. He's actually beaten up three reporters from this paper alone for doubting his story. And one is about to get beaten up right here. Ed is hoping he can do a story that will be a real adventure, even though the act of standing in one place without screwing it up seems beyond his abilities. He gets ink all over his face, slips on something, breaks the door to the editor's office, and falls into the room. Well, the editor takes one look at this pinhead and says, That's the man we should send to cover Challenger's lecture. This is a man who is used to getting his ass kicked after all. At the museum, Ed meets Sir John Roxton, a famous explorer and hunter. That's not mentioned in the film, but he and Roxton were friends already. Also not mentioned is that Roxton was fiercely anti-slavery. In fact, he put a notch on his rifle for every slaver that he killed. He's here to listen to Challenger's crazy assertions, and a bunch of students are also here to make fun of the crazy old man. While Ed can't help but wonder what Challenger hopes to gain sticking with such impossible lies, but Roxton is at least open-minded that there might be something truly amazing in an area that's the size of unexplored Amazon, and says to at least let Challenger state his case, instead of dismissing him out of hand. Roxton gives him his own pass so he can come inside and hear for himself, no doubt knowing that with his reputation he'll be able to just walk in without one. No one wants to be the one trying to stop a person who's famous for killing big animals. Well, the society says they're not going to endorse Professor Challenger's views, but they are willing to give him this form to present his case. But he doesn't even get a chance to speak before some of the students are ridiculing him. So he, appropriately, challenges any skeptic to join him in heading to this lost world to see for themselves the truth that he has witnessed. And with that, all the laughing students are suddenly quiet, afraid of the threat of the jungle, while Professor Summerlee, a 67-year-old man, is willing to brave them just to prove Challenger a fraud. That's the kind of skepticism we're talking about, kids. The kind that says, I'll march into the jungle just to say you're full of shit. Roxton likewise volunteers to join, and so does Ed. Challenger asks what this strong-looking young man does for a living, and upon learning this is a journalist, someone willing to come along on his expedition and bring back a first-hand account of the truth of his claims, Challenger, of course, I don't need to tell you, attempts to beat the crap out of him, driving him from the building in his rage. Well, Ed is determined to prove himself to Gladys, so he follows Challenger home to make his case, deciding the best way to get into the man's good graces is crawling in through the window. To the surprise of no one, Challenger attacks him until the pair roll out into the street, dragging a cop into this. For some reason, despite clearly being a home invader, Ed is the one with the right to press charges for assault. Well, he refuses. He admits he was to blame for starting all this by slipping in the window. Given that and his mention of befriending Roxton, Challenger is willing to hear him out. He asks point blank if Ed believes him, but before he gets a chance to answer, 
Roxton arrives and says to show Ed the diary, and also brings in Paula White, the daughter of the man whose diary this is, and she was thoroughly trained to assist her father in this work. In fact, it was only because she'd become ill that she was stuck in the camp instead of being with her father when he went to explore that lost world. It was the sight of the dinosaurs that terrified their local help into breaking camp and abandoning her father there. This expedition isn't so much about Professor Challenger's reputation as it is a rescue mission for her father, and given that, Ed figures with Roxton coming with him to sell the editor on this, the paper might just fund the whole thing, you know, for a chance at an exclusive. The famous explorer and game hunter is going to be a strong endorsement. Yeah, he's hunting that booty. We pick up with them in the Amazon, awaiting the arrival of Professor Challenger while Ed is writing up his narrative, two-finger style. He can't stop looking at Paula, though. Of course, he's not going to do anything about it, and not right now, anyway. They haven't even gotten into peril yet. Only once you've been in danger does the boning come in. Uh, speaking of coming in... Yeah, feel free to use your matter transporter anytime. Those are pretty confident words from a man who left his partner behind the last time he came here. He's brought a monkey, Jocko, who is already annoying Summerly, but he's useful for this expedition. He can identify edible foods in the jungle, so he's coming along. Summerly can stay here with the lady with the guitar if he likes which actually probably would. So they set off, and there's a lot of nature here. Remember, at the time, this was a real spectacle of a film. And it's got leopards, pythons, a sloth, all live animals, too. Some with the actors clearly in frame reacting to creatures, obviously not in a situation where real danger could take place. Even in 1925, I have to believe that there were some kind of safety rules in place to stop that sort of thing. After a three-week journey, they reach the plateau of the Lost World, and an ape man is looking down at our party, disapproving. This is a closed neighborhood, as far as he's concerned. While amusing themselves watching bears fight over access to their food, possibly planning to place bets later, plans are being made about the ascent up onto the plateau. They're going to climb up this jagged side over here, and then fell the remaining tree much the same way that Paula's father had originally in order to create a bridge to get over to the plateau. But they already have some proof that Professor Challenger is telling the truth, and not just because the ape man tries dropping a boulder on them like some asshole. No, there's a pterodactyl flying around. In fact, it snatches up a wild boar and begins eating it alive. <laughs> That was wasteful. Killed him for a couple mouthfuls. I mean, dinosaurs are dicks. In all seriousness, this scene really showcased for audiences the amazing effects that they were in for. I mean, that was a very intricate scene, all done with stop motion. It's really remarkable to see how painstaking this must have been in order to be this detailed. Even the breathing of the trapped boar. Anyway, with definitive proof of dinosaurs... And yes, I know pterodactyls aren't dinosaurs, it's just, you know, they're kind of considered a tag-along for the party. The others are ready to climb to the top and cross over the plateau to see what's there. A brontosaurus watches them, and it does not approve of putting a tree there, and it demonstrates this by ripping up a tree of its own, roots and all. The humans are amazed, and Professor Challenger assures them that while this is all impressive, this dinosaur is harmless. And good thing, as Roxton admits that even his elephant gun wouldn't have a chance against it. Although, why would he want to shoot it? All right, because the brontosaurus is a dick. Just like the pterodactyl. That should be the subtitle. The Lost World. Dinosaurs are dicks. So they're stranded on the plateau, just like Paula's father meaning they miss out on the white guy in blackface acting like comic relief back in the camp. 
As they note the smoke from the fire of our heroes, we see the expedition is still underway up there. Summerlee studying the animals, and Ed name drops the title, asking what Paula thinks about this lost world. She says that if her father were alive, he'd have seen the smoke of the fire and come here. This rescue mission isn't looking too promising, is it? They soon witness an Allosaurus attack a duck-billed dinosaur, compelling them all to grab guns in the hopes that that'll make a difference. Professor Challenger refers to the Allosaurus as a pest, as if it's some kind of a mosquito. Man, that's a badass thing to say. It's like, oh, man-eating sharks? Man, those annoy me to no end. The Allosaurus takes out the duck-billed dinosaur, and barely eating any of its kill, now goes on to attack a triceratops that's protecting its young. Failing at this task, it then finds our humans, and heads in to take them out. Look at the detail that O'Brien puts into this, by the way. The strands of saliva in its mouth to make it look more organic. This may be hard to grok today, but this is a master class in quality special effects. They manage to drive it off with guns and fire, so then it tries its luck with another Triceratops, a bigger one, where it then dies a gruesome death. All in all, it really should have just finished off its duck-billed dinosaur instead of pressing its luck like this. Ed says that a better camp is called for if they want to be able to defend themselves, and Roxton agrees. So Ed climbs a tree to try to scout around for an ideal spot, unaware that the ape man takes issue with someone trespassing on his tree. Rather than throwing poop at Ed like he normally would, the ape man climbs up, likely intent on knocking him off the branch to his death. Well, Roxton shoots it before it gets the chance, and Ed has good news. He spotted a cave that they can make camp in. And it's timely, because another, larger Allosaurus takes down the Triceratops that had killed the other one. And then, having killed this enormous Triceratops and having enough food for weeks, the Allosaurus then turns away and takes out a Pterodactyl, because as established, dinosaurs are dicks. So our heroes relocate camp to the cave, fashioning a tree into a makeshift stepladder, so they can easily get in and out of it. With that scene too, Professor Challenger is working on a catapult to attack the Allosaurus if it comes around, using the old pull-down-a-tree trick. However, he and Summerlee get into a semantic argument about whether the path of the rock will be a curve or a parabola, until Summerlee is accidentally launched by the thing and tossed into a pond. But while those hijinks are going on outside, inside the cave, Ed is told Paula, not to give up hope. Her father might not have come last night because he was hiding in his own cave. And at his half right, her father is hiding in his own cave. Uh, this one. Rather, he was hiding in this cave. Roxton comes across his remains. Well, after he's brushed off the dinosaur poop, he can definitely confirm this was Maple White's watch. There's a picture of Paula inside. Meanwhile, back in the comic relief camp, the two guys get themselves an idea. Jocko likes to climb up the side of the plateau to get to Paula. So what they're going to do is unravel all their hammocks and other stuff to make really long rope for them to be able to climb down. Roxton seems to have the same idea. The end of the cave opens on the side of the plateau, so he fires off his revolver to try to get their attention. He knows the brain power that he's dealing with here, so he fires off enough shots to empty the revolver just to make sure that they can gather where he is and what he wants. Ed and Paula have no idea about any of this, though, and they think that they'll be stuck here the rest of their lives. Time to do the Triassic Tango! He says there's no need to worry about Gladys, that they might as well be on the moon as far as their past obligations go. In fact, he wants Professor Summerlee to perform a marriage ceremony for the two of them, and Roxton, while disappointed, accepts this with grace. He doesn't want to break her heart. He's a gentleman of dignity and honor, and on a completely unrelated topic, your father was eaten by dinosaurs. Enjoy the watch, you stone-cold bitch. During all of this, Professor Challenger and Summerlee have also been doing science, observing local creatures in their natural habitat. They're naturally very interested in the Brontosaurus. But then the unexpected happens. 
an Allosaurus shows up, ready to throw down, but the Bronto, rather well, amazingly, bites down on its throat. Yes. It was like that time that Jimmy Carter got attacked by a rabbit. The two creatures struggle, and the Allosaurus only survives because the Bronto gets knocked over the side of the plateau. Its landing is cushioned by water, but as it lays in the muddy remains of the pond that it fell into, it's not looking so great. But it's not looking great for the Lost World either. Earlier, Roxton had seen fire belching up in one of the caves, and now other explorers note that the volcano on that plateau is smoking, and likely it's going to erupt. Our only hope now is that the others return to the cave so Roxton can show them the way down before the lava gets them. Let's be very clear about what this movie is. This is a 1920s popcorn flick. If you want to have intellectual adventure, that's what Sherlock Holmes is for. But if you want to have incredible spectacle, a high adventure out in the jungle with all kinds of fantastical things taking place, and one peril after the next, then this is what you're looking for. Remember, these special effects on this scale was just mind-blowing at the time. This was the equivalent of what Star Wars was for the 70s, what Jurassic Park was for the 90s, what The Matrix was for the end of the millennium. Yes, there's a human interest element to it, but the film was there to thrill people by showing them the impossible, something they never thought they would see with their own eyes. Keep in mind that there is no prior precedent for this sort of thing. In our time, special effects have evolved. We know the past of them. But for them, the closest thing they had would be pictures in a book or, or maybe a cartoon. But that's not what they're getting here. They're getting moving dinosaurs often alongside tiny human beings. This is the kind of thing most of the audience likely never imagined they could ever see. Not ever. To us, the creatures may look unsophisticated. But in this time, the Lost World was truly transporting its audience into another world. And even for us looking back, we can appreciate the painstaking artistry that is required to produce this illusion. When one looks at this, adding in the deleted footage only makes sense. People came to the Lost World for the fantastic. Give them the fantastic. So as the dinosaurs flee the lava, fortunately it doesn't encompass the entirety of the plateau, so it's not like a, you know, an environment-destroying disaster or anything. It's just going to really ruin their afternoon. The trio that was stuck outside are working desperately to get back to their cave. This scene is well realized and was likely the inspiration for the similar scene in Jurassic World 2 Dinosaur Mansion. Thankfully, all three members of the party survive and make it to the cave, and thanks to Jocko, they now have a rope ladder they can use to get down safely. Only the ape man has spotted them and comes to menace them one final time during their descent. Creature is so strong that even with people hanging on the end of it, it can still pull the ladder back up again. Finally, Roxon just has to shoot it. Oh, that'll learn him. But while they've escaped, Paula points out they're back in the world of obligations. And while Ed doesn't want anyone but her, Paula says that she can't be the one to break up his engagement, much as it breaks her own heart. It just wouldn't be right. So while Roxton sees his chance to be the rebound, everyone else is interested in the brontosaurus trapped in the mud. Eventually, Roxton, sportsman though he is, sees the potential of it and says the real triumph wouldn't be to shoot this thing, but to bring it back to London alive. And arrangements are made to do just that. So back in London, Professor Challenger can triumphantly tell everyone not only does he have proof, but this time he's actually brought a living specimen with him, and nothing could possibly go wrong. Anyway, Ed calls up to say something has gone wrong. Seems that the cables couldn't support the weights. The cage fell, and, well, long story short, the brontosaurus is running amok. <laughs> Well, being in an era without smartphones, there's no way for them all to just know that there's a dinosaur running through the streets when Challenger walks out to say, I'm sorry, but it looks like the proof has escaped and is now rampaging through the streets. They think he's full of crap. 
And the way this crowd is so hostile to them, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if they went outside, saw the dinosaur, and said maybe some other explorer brought it back. Yeah, I think Admiral Byrd said something about bringing back a dinosaur, didn't he? Cancel culture, 1925 style. The police have to protect Challenger on his way out of the building from this mob, but the crowd in the streets is vindication at least. This, of course, is the real thrilling part of the film. Note especially the way that O'Brien is able to include his dinosaur with entire crowds of people. I mean, this really was telling the audience that they were seeing an actual brontosaurus running through the streets of London. Fortunately, despite the temptation, they resist the urge to have the dinosaur munch on anyone, staying true to the nature of the beast as a herbivore, while still showing its capacity to menace. The dinosaur chases people all over town, demolishes buildings, and nearly steps on them, before it finally heads onto London Bridge, and, tempted though I am by the low-hanging fruit when part of the bridge collapses under the weight, I will not say the obvious. Instead, minutes from the ending, as crowds watch the Brontosaurus and the Thames, Ed finally meets up with Gladys, who, turns out, is married now, to some mild-mannered clerk that's never left town before. She puts down what she said to girlish whims, but whatever, you are better off, Ed. You're like the guy whose fiancé dumps him because he failed the polygraph she made him take. However much it might hurt right now, you're really just sparing yourself a whole lifetime of that kind of fickle bullshit. Ed, look at this guy. Look at that face. That's a face that's going to grow to become the Green Goblin in time. Well, with that behind him, Ed can now go to Paula, who's waiting there, and... Well, Roxy can see that her heart really belongs to Ed anyway. So as the happy couple drive off together and the dinosaur swims out to sea, Challenger just collapses on the bridge. It's been a long day for him, after all. And it's the end of the movie. I don't really have anything to add. It's a work that was made to be a spectacle, and in that it succeeds admirably. I mean, it's not going to impress me viscerally with its effects like it would have for those nearly a century ago, but it still is impressive nevertheless, and the story around it is perfectly serviceable, if at times silly and, in a few small cases, sort of terribly offensive. But yeah, The Lost World, a restored classic film, and plus, it's in the public domain. You can go watch it right now without having to spend any money at all, just your time. And believe me, it would be time well spent. <laughs>